people's mindsets are strong despite poverty they are strong enough to stand up and be counted for them gummanda has been a source of strength for over a decade gummanda for the people by the people news first news line with faraz shaukatali and a very good evening to you and a warm welcome to Newsline Live. Today, Sri Lanka's Supreme Court, it was announced that Sri Lanka's Supreme Court quite literally knocked the rehab bill out of the ground. Not just for six, but out of the ground. And like I've said before on this program, thank God Almighty for the Supreme Court. To discuss what happened, I've got here the uh, president of the Young Lawyers um, Movement of the SJB, Mr. Taraka Nanekara. Very good evening to you, Mr. Nanekara. Good evening to you. Thank you very much for being on the program. But, uh, you know, uh, because um, I posed the question because Sri Lanka is uh, totally busy uh, watching the cricket, and um, this network, of course, um, won the rights to uh, broadcast that, no, so we're very proud of all that. But, you know, so in cricketing terms, uh, the Supreme Court um, quite literally knocked the ball out of the, out of the ground, not just over the boundary. Good, bad, w as expected? Correct. I think uh, the determination today uh, that was announced by the Speaker mm. is a historic and a landmark determination of the Supreme Court why do I say that? Mm. I say that because generally when you challenge the constitutionality of a particular bill, the general determination mm. would be certain clauses shall be deemed to be unconstitutional mm. or in violation of a particular clause of the particular article of the constitution so to speak mm. and uh, a way out as to how that can be cured <coughs> or uh, specifying a special majority in parliament or the referendum or referendum to go with it. Mm -hmm. But this time the Supreme Court in making a determination on the Bureau of Rehabilitation bill mm. has come to the conclusion that this particular bill is in violation of Article 12.1 of the Constitution that mm. is the article that guarantees equal protection before the law mm. in totality. Right. In totality. So all 38, 39 clauses? In totality, it's in violation, the entire bill is right. in violation of uh, the right to equal protection of the law. Because uh, the, by definition, yeah. the class of people who are covered by this bill yeah. is endless. They say ex-combatants, ex-militants, members of misguided uh, violent groups and any other persons. So, the, so none of this, I believe, is, uh, is specified. Uh, who equals a ex-combatant? Is it LTT? Is it I don't know. So any any anybody that they think is an ex-combatant. Exactly. And what is a combatant? Exactly. So generally, in a statute or in a bill, yeah. when you incorporate a particular word yeah. to define a person or a class of persons who are affected yeah. by that bill, yeah. you define that class. But yeah. in this bill, yeah. They start saying, whereas having the regard to regard and to the need and the importance of regulating the rehabilitation of misguided combatants, individuals engaged in extreme or destructive acts of sabotage and yeah. who have become drug dependent and it have become a serious problem. Then they come into the objectives clause, again refers to those classes of people, but there is no definition or yeah. interpretation of any of these specified classes of people. So yeah. that itself it makes this bill very vague, absolutely vague, and it lacks clarity. Lacks clarity, and it's it's targeted to cover a very wide class of persons okay. under this bill. Now, <clears throat> some people may be wondering why on earth we're discussing this when the Supreme Court has given its uh, determination. But of course, if the government so want, they can try and pass it, uh, pass all the clauses that uh, the Supreme Court has mentioned, they can try and pass it in Parliament 
uh, the, uh, I think it's a two-thirds majority. Two-thirds majority. And then take it to the ref a referendum of the Certain people. Certain clauses Certain to a referendum. Yes. So in which case, so there is always that possibility. But um, the wider picture, of course, uh, Taraka, is that the fact that this government even so much as attempted to put to pass this bill through isn't it indicative of the fact that this government are recognizing the people's economic and social distress and more than half expect them to get on the streets or in some way or other uh, express their dissatisfaction at the at matters current and this is yet another attempt of the government to control the constitutional right of the people to have a different opinion and to protest and so on. Yes, I think uh, you are correct on that observation. Mm. Uh, the government of the day should anticipate uh, people's distress and take positive steps mm. to relieve the people's distress. Mm. There's issue there's an issue about food safety, food security, yep. cost of living, yep. that includes the cost of utilities, electricity, water, so yep. on and so forth, fuel, yes. energy. Yes. There's a crisis in every sector, yes. in every sector of life, affecting people from all walks of life. Mm. What should the government do? The government should take positive sp steps to alleviate these difficulties, to do away with dif these difficulties, but instead, they are finding ways and means to curtail protests, to uh, pressurize people into uh, pressurize people who are going to take to streets to protest peacefully mm. for their rights, mm. because they are not doing the right thing. Mm. They, are, they, are, they think the government believes by uh, by imposing penal sanctions on people who exercise their constitutional right mm. of uh, free speech, maybe of association, of protest. They think the government think you can curtail those protests, but I <coughs> say they're badly misguided. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, thank you very much for your questions uh, uh, to all our viewers. Uh, by SMS or WhatsApp as you deem fit, 0772-300-305. And, um, <sighs> Here's an astute, I, I think it's an astute observation. But President uh, Vikram Singer uh, addressed the nation and he said uh, about the need to impose these taxes and so on and so forth and asked the people once more to uh, tighten their belts. This bill appears to me that, he, he, that the government of the day wants the people to tighten up uh, or to curtail their rights. And uh, uh, again, I say thank God for the Supreme Court uh, because that is the last bastion of hope for uh, the people of this country and the Supreme Court has been petitioned by various people and today we have that determination. But back to the President and his speech uh, and this question here, it says here that they, they noticed that the President didn't talk about wastage in government and um, the the message goes on to say that there are the there is no room and the president ought to have mentioned it for sweetheart deals like the sugar scam and the garlic scam uh, one sweet the other smelly but if you know what I mean <laughs> do, you, do you think that the public there have got the message they must have because they're sending me messages like this Yes, I believe uh, that uh, the president who portrays <coughs> himself as the messiah who is going to take Sri Lanka out of distress. Churchill. <laughs> Churchill, who says I will have to take tough decisions, I will take strong decisions, but I will put the country out of misery. Yeah. He's putting the country into his eternal misery. Mm. To speak of the tax regime, yes, direct taxation should be imposed. Mm. Who took it off? His own predecessor, mm. whom he protected by coming in as the Prime Minister, acting mm. Prime Minister, and then becoming the President. 600 billion worth of uh, tax income was foregone just to please a particular class of people who supported Gotabe Rajapaksha. Mm. Then 
came in the fertilizer crisis affecting our food security and uh, now Mr. Vikramasinghe and his government mm. is trying to justify the tax regime but there has to be a balance between the direct and indirect taxation you must take into account the pressure that you put on small and middle income uh, businesses small and middle level businesses out of the 10,000 odd uh, small and middle level businesses more than 70 percent are affected and what if these businesses go down mm. the employees the employment they create yes. so this is going to create a very vicious cycle they have put imposed tax on exports for mm. the first time mm. if I'm not mistaken a 30 yes. percent uh, tax uh, imposition on export earnings for the first time in the recent history because but, but there's no I'm sorry but there's no reference to addressing endemic corruption exactly endemic corruption exactly to come come to your exact question you look at the government sector mr vikramasinghe and his government his uh, slpp unp hybrid government or crossbreed government uh, appointed 15 or so cabinet ministers in the first round mm. 20 or so state ministers in the second round and are contemplating the appointment of more ministers mm. how what are, have you curtailed the perks given to the ministers yeah. every minister gets three official vehicles three vehicles for his staff six paid secretaries and when he takes over when a particular minister is running two ministries mm. he gets double of that all oh, right so these things have not been curtailed yes they will cur they will uh, impose regulations uh, the secretary of the public administration ministry will write to uh, the AGS, GS, government, sec ministry secretaries, you switch off your lights, you put your AC, uh, air condition uh, temperature up, mm. they will say that, but what have the ministers done to sacrifice? Well, I did ask this question on the program, and I know people uh, who are working for these high officials who do keep a check on, uh, they do listen in on, our, on all our programs and uh, not only ours on, on all the networks and of course I did pose the question whether the president the prime minister ministers state ministers anybody would they like to send us you can send it by whatsapp 0772 300 305 send me a thing and say show me how much your pre-crisis consumption of electricity was and how much the post-crisis during the crisis consumption is I would love to hear from all these officials especially the elected ones why not the appointed ones too don't you think that would be a good idea would you as citizen Sri Lanka forget the fact that you're a lawyer would you like to know how much your president is actually saving of course and also you look at the electricity you look at the fuel consumption if if, if what I've heard is right a minister gets a fuel allowance in total of in excess of 2,000 liters a month for his three or six vehicles sorry yes. but in, in my humble opinion that's criminal I think you're correct uh, sorry that, that's public actually, funds it is it is so <sighs> But why, uh, you know, Tarka, why, why did they even contemplate such a draconian uh, bill to be brought forward? I can understand it coming in the administration of uh, Gotabe Rajapaksa, but I simply, for the life of me, cannot understand wh how this can be promoted and brought forth in the presidency of somebody who is supposedly the champion of democracy. Uh, were vice president of the IDU at one point. I am as confused as you are when it comes to this, but I see hardly any difference between uh, Gota Brajapaksa's regime and Mr. Rani Vikramasinghe's regime, simply for the reason the day after he took over as the president, when uh, the uh, golfers, protesters had undertaken to leave mm. the uh, presidential secretariat and the surroundings at 2 p.m. on a particular day forces entered in at 12 midnight assaulted chased them away mm. so that was the first show of force mm. so starting from that point I don't know where uh, the championing of democracy has gone in mm. his thoughts but mm. what I see is an oppressive regime I don't see 
any democracy prevailing uh, during uh, the very short uh, tenure of Mr. Vikramasinghe that we have experienced. We seem to have, we seem to have a repetition. It's like almost like history repeating itself. And I'll say this uh, ahead of this uh, break that we're going into. But ahead of that, let me say this: many years ago, we had a chap called Mahinda Rajapaksa. He went to Geneva on human rights matters. He championed the cause of the Palestinian people, quite rightly too, because they are being treated as though they are a very special class of people in this world without human rights. And he championed their cause. And yet, once he ascended the presidency, that all seemed to change. And that is exactly what you're saying about this one. I suppose so. Is, it, is this something in the DNA of our people, of our politicians? Duplicity has been observed in so many politicians. I'm not talking about the independence heroes, maybe not uh, in people of the caliber of Right Honorable D.S. Nayaka and so on, but in the recent past, we've seen many mm. who have preached one thing before coming into power and practice something else. So I believe uh, the present president is no different to his predecessor and uh, also uh, Mahindra Paksha, former president. On that note, let's go for a quick break. But somebody is saying here, RW was not elected, so he won't have to send you his electricity consumption figures. I'm not asking whether he's elected or unelected. We're just, he's the president. I'd like to know. Simple. See you on the other side of the break. <clears throat> News First Newsline with Faraz Shaukutali. Sri Lanka beat the Netherlands, becomes first team from Group A to enter the Super 12. 22nd Amendment taken up for debate in Parliament, opposition leader lays down conditions for support. Bureau of Rehabilitation Bill inconsistent with the Constitution, a determination from the Supreme Court. Joint protest in Mahyanganer against suppression. Opposition parties, except for the JVP, enter a common framework for polls. Case filed against individual police officers for obstructing peaceful protests. A trusted place for your fixed deposit. Valuable FD, 25% for two months. 25.5% for four months. Valuable FD, the symbol of stability. News First, Newsline with Faraz Shaukutali. And welcome back to Newsline Live. On the day that the Supreme Court of Sri Lanka quite literally knocks the rehab bill over the ground, out of the ground, and on the day that we have Tarek Ananyakara here, uh, the president of the Young Lawyers Movement of the SJB, who are fighting anti-corruption. You want to get corruption out of the way. Don't you think, um, Tarek Ananyakara, that the one quick fix way of knocking corruption completely out of the field would be for the government to stop being in business, for the government to privatize all state-owned enterprises, because several of them, the majority of them, are loss-making and the people pay for them. I believe you have a very valid point. You look at Sri Lankan Airlines, for instance, mm. you look at the electricity board, you look at the Petroleum Corporation or Petro uh, Cipetco, mm. these are organizations which have a monopoly. Mm. A business that has a monopoly, enjoys a monopoly yeah. in a particular territory, failing or making losses is unacceptable. Mm. So clearly, uh, loss-making government entities have to be restructured, to say the least. Mm. However, it has to be regulated because you can't expect the private sector to 
run these sensitive industries, especially pet be it petroleum, be it electricity, be it water, mm. you, ca you have to have strict regulations. And uh, even trans public transport, all these have to be restructured in a mm. positive manner. And uh, particularly, the corruption doesn't end there. It's only one, uh, it's only the tip of the iceberg, the corruption in state-owned, uh, and losses in the state-owned enterprises. Mm. But uh, the corruption r runs into the very core of the state machinery, starting from the ministers, uh, ministry secretaries, officials, uh, for approvers, for go-aheads, for land releases, all over. I'm not accusing or pointing a finger at everyone. There are so many honorable uh, government officials. But you can be more, but you could be more honorable if we had laws uh, that control political funding, call it what you may, political donations act like they have in Singapore, um, campaign funding like they have in the United States and in, in uh, the UK, but something all along those lines needs to be in place and implemented, not just to have it like a showpiece and to show anyone who's interested that Sri Lanka has all these things. It's like the Right to Information Act. Despite that, I believe that one lot of people were trying to get uh, one Rani Wickremesinghe's um, asset declaration. It's, I think, before court. So you have an RTI, but you know, you can't get what you need. Yes, now uh, when it comes to asset declarations, I think you raise an important point. But uh, who is ascertaining whether the declarations are correct, declarations are factual? Is there anybody? And as you said, you raised a very valid point about restrictions on campaign funding. Mm. That will ensure that uh, people uh, with ill-gotten money yeah. coming into politics or using ill-gotten money to safeguard their political careers can be put on a check. The current matter of uh, a um, female person with the office at the one uh, prime Colombo location where they reckon, they reckon, some reports, unverified probably, three billion rupees. I'd like to know if Mr. Hapuarachi at the Inland Revenue Department is on the case already. Is he on the case to find out from these people where on earth they got three billion or whatever it is. One of them's got 226 million. And he says he says he's got proof. I wonder if Mr. Haporachi, who happens to be the uh, top man at the Inland Revenue, whether he is going to be on their case. I sincerely hope so, because this is money that is out of the official uh, financial circulation. It can be in the form of rupees. Who knows it can be in the form, who knows whether it's in the form of foreign currency. Mm. So who knows whether it's uh, the money that is inside the system or who knows whether this money uh, is obviously most of this being ill-gotten gains, maybe of politicians, maybe of businessmen, maybe of officials. Mm. This is a massive can of worms that we must push them to open mm. because the banking system, the financial system, the economic uh, body of Sri Lanka is the entire economic a sector of Sri Lanka is suffering and people like this handling 300, 400 million rupees yeah. or more. I, I am not suggesting for a moment, I am not suggesting for a moment uh, before you get your letters of demand out, you know, I might as well say, I am not suggesting for a moment that there is anything wrong here. But I am only posing the question whether the chief at the Inland Revenue Department is getting his team in order to check if these monies are black or white. Yeah, I think that's a reasonable expectation. I mean, as people, as, as citizens, tax, taxpayers, citizens, yeah. we have a right to question the authorities whether they're doing the job simply. So yes. I don't think there's any cause for letter of demand there for you for us. <laughs> no, but you know how, uh, how, um, how flimsy such things can be at times. But, you know, we, we thought we'd uh, just mention it, uh, because one has to. But uh, Tarakan Nanakara, as a 
youth citizen of this country, and a professional one at that, we've got economic crisis, we've got a dollar crisis, we've got a food crisis, we've got a tax crisis, we've got an interest rate crisis, soon we'll have a, dra a brain drain crisis, and so on. But we have fainting kids in school. We have kids who are being provided lunches by their dear darling teachers, thanks to the goodness of do-gooders around that particular school. But this can't be the system. <clears throat> you know, it is absolutely um, nonsensical. The, the fertilizer for paddy is 200,000 a kilo, uh, sorry, a ton, 360,000 for others. So the prices cannot come down when you have an interest rate regime that is in excess of 30%. And these politicians put things out like that blessed bill. They've wasted everybody's time when they ought to have been spending the last 90 days because they came in here to uh, solve a sort of Churchillian task and nothing's happened. What do you feel as a youth in this country? I think uh, it's very unfortunate that after a massive uprising of the people, seeking to overthrow a president who did not uh, uphold the wishes of the general public or the citizens, the government that came after that mm. and the president who took over could have and should have done more to alleviate the suffering of the people. Why did people get on the streets in the first place? Because of the hunger, firstly, and because of the authoritarian nature of the previous government. and. Uh, the the series of wrong and uh, misguided decisions they made affecting our food security after centuries. Sri Lanka mm. has been known for its agricultural uh, prowess over the centuries, over the years. And now we are on the verge of a food, massive food security crisis, so much so that the World Food Program has identified that one out of every four persons in Sri Lanka are at the risk of not having sufficient food on the table in mm. the coming few months. Mm. So what is the government doing? What is the president and his merry band of ministers doing to alleviate the suffering of the people? But we don't see anything positive as youth. Mm. We say if they do not take any positive steps, the second wave of people's protests will be coming to the streets very soon and that will f have further impact on the economy. So I urge the president and the government to take positive steps to take important uh, aspects of human life into consideration and to take positive steps, make positive decisions to alleviate the suffering of the people. Well, uh, you know, Taraka, uh, all I can say this is that you're pretty lucky after that uh, statement that uh, the Bureau of Rehabilitation is still not uh, you know, part of the law uh, because then uh, you may have been sent off for brainwashing. Exactly, uh, when, when, the, when the cabinet, so original, Pot cabinet style. Yes, original cabinet paper for this bill mm. wanted to send people who are the subject of investigations also into rehabilitation or at least that voluntary was in the cabinet paper. That was in the original cabinet paper is brought into light uh, in the Sub-Business Council's I, I would love to meet this person. Is it one person who drew up that cabinet paper? Uh, well, uh, I we don't, don't have know. sufficient information at the moment. Mm. But there's one thing that to me is very strange. The President addressed the nation and he said that, you know, look, if you want this help from the IMF, we've got to listen to what they're saying. So this is it's basically listen to them, comply and then we can sort our problems out. That's what he said, in essence. But he's, he's listening to some foreigners about that part of it, but the same, some of the same foreigners are also casting uh, grave doubts uh, and concern about the arresting of these peaceful protesters and um, taking them before courts and so on. But he's not listening to those things. So I see that uh, our government is being selective. Of course, selective in action, selective in hearing, 
selective in comprehension, selective in everything. So, not only that, the IMF officials also said at, at the staff level visit, after the staff level visit, mm. that uh, these changes should be implemented with a stable government, with mm. a government that has the support of the people. So that part they have selectively ignored, in addition to what you s mentioned that he has ignored already. Yes. All I can say is at the end of the day, 134 is the magic figure. They elected and appointed the president and therefore we must admit the fact that the 134 are the puppeteers. Tarek and Anikara, thank you very much. Thank you very program. much. It's, it's now time for the primetime news. Take care, have a great evening, and as always, God bless you all.